I thought I'd talk about what it is that I'm actually doing at present in relation to the question of um, digital arts and ideas around the way in which Kingston University and a few other universities um, in the UK are dealing with this. The notion of these three elements being creative, theoretical and technical are considered in relation to how interdisciplinarity is transacted, how interdisciplinary practices or practices that might be considered sometime to be unitary are considered to be able to be um, engaged with other disciplines. The motivation for such engagement is usually around the, the cliche of knowledge exchange, experience exchange, um, I think that there are also a, a variety of other worthy causes that amount to people, um, in fact, sharing ideas about how they approach whatever it is that they do in their particular practice. Um, the notion that some people in some practices are creative and some people in other practices are technical and some people in other practices are theoretical, is something that needs to be, in fact, rebrokeraged, re 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 renegotiated. Because if in any particular strand of education uh, you examine what's actually going on, they're usually a combination of all three. There's usually some kind of contextual theoretical study associated with some kind of notion of creativity or some kind of notion of technicality whether the technicality be about um, the literal interpretation of technicality, machines, whatever, or a much more intellectual uh, interpretation of technicality in relation to how to achieve certain things, for example, in music, how to achieve certain um, ideas of cadence, ideas of flow, etc., ideas of orchestration, um, how to achieve certain kinds of ideas about editing, about um, time-based work, how to apply creative thought to theoretical and or technical problems. All these issues are really at the core of why interdisciplinary practice or interdisciplinary collaborative venture is important that one considers and in some places not adds on but structures educational and opportunities within education to explore how crossovers, interdisciplinary engagement can happen in various ways. Um, what I've put there are a number of really obvious, straightforward things that everybody would imagine. Music for film and television, animation, audio art, visual art, communication design, the notion of designing communication as opposed to the notion of um, allowing communication to happen, um, sound and design, games development, um, digital performance, performing arts, digital media, documentation and performance. The whole, the whole idea that what we're engaging in now is that um, because of available technical resources and because of the push to in fact explore um, the digital worlds, we are able to produce 
performative events and document those performative events and then through the documentation of performative events actually remake art so it becomes a kind of model of I think about it it's like the world's turned into Photoshop, you know. There's, it's a kind of layering that happens and little bits get cut out and little bits shine through and if you put the same image on top of, on top of, on top of, on top of, you can actually create the illusion of a three-dimensional world in, in a flat two screen. That was, uh, that was live to air at ABC TV. Art and science is actually kind of um, meeting in some kind of engagement at the moment where one would hope that some kind of equity in relation to um, credible engagement can transpire and lead to the idea that theoretical, creative and technical can actually have a marriage and that there isn't any kind of dominant culture where either science and or art is, is in the ascendancy. So this idea about health, um, about image, um, about computing or IT and so forth is very much um, on the agenda. Um, here's, here's a kind of deconstruction of three kinds of three kinds of approaches to art. This is a, this is, um, this is a fine art person having, wanting to make lo video loops and use, use them and mash them on something and then taking it somewhere else in Photoshop and making that out of it. And then this is a music technology pe person using Max MSP to 
put noise across the image and make something else. So this creative engagement technical idea has outputs, has outcomes that have different visions. And I don't think that the issue is that there are problems with having different visions. I think that the, the different visions are, in fact, very healthy. I think what needs to happen is that the opportunity for the spinning roundabout be seen as an opportunity to make something, to deconstruct something, to realise something, to then take that and make a... Students have taken that and made a film in which they perform with that as either a backdrop or project on their bodies, in fact. So growing interdisciplinary relationships, relationships with uh, industry, research, cultures, pedagogies, and management models. I put management models in there because um, I think it's very important to know how to, in fact, um, produce events that involve interdisciplinary action. Um, collaborative contexts. Place and identity. I think place and identity, um, rather than becoming less important, are in fact becoming more important. For example, there's a lot of, there are a lot of projects that we do. Uh, we have an architecture um, school in our faculty. Quite often, um, we'll have a project with 30 or 40 students where we go to a place uh, in Belgium or in somewhere. Uh, uh, last year, they went, to, they went to some docklands in Belgium and they planned how to, in fact, um, uh, refurbish a whole. It was a big warehouse and, um, and a bunch of shops that had been deserted and nobody was there anymore. So they, they filled it with... Um, basically images and drawings and plans about how they would reuse that space, about how they would regenerate and how they would make that space sustainable for um, a, a future um, centre for a variety of things. There was, apart from shops and stuff, there was the way in which people might engage with a particular space, much like, I guess, the, the history of this space here has transpired over the last 30, 40 years. If you were here um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, it's, a, you know, where we're standing is a place where there was um, used tires stacked at least 30 high, I remember, and uh, corrugated iron fence around. So the way in which spaces evolved is, um, uh, project ideas about place and identity, that involves designers, architectures, architects, musicians, performers, um, all going to a place, putting on an event, um, reconfiguring a space and uh, making a proposal that then was taken up, in fact, by um, government bodies within the area um, and, <clears throat> and then further develop. In fact, there's a relationship going on with that particular project and they've actually been there twice now and they're going again. So each time they go, it's a sort of um, an add-on. This is a little animation I did with um, Max Banner.
It ends badly. Um, <laughs> that was the beginning of the encroachment of, um, of big buildings in Brisbane. Um, the, the animator is a guy called um, Max Banner, who I've done quite a few things with. Um, projects and sites of performance. I thought I'd just show you some of the stu student work. Last year I did two projects um, <coughs> that involved uh, interdisciplinary work. The first one was called Sonic Plinth. The second one was called May Day. In Sonic Plinth, uh, it was about a co collaboration between performers, people doing sculpture, fine artists, and uh, music technology people. Um, music technology people basically wired everything with contact mics and mixed hundreds of, I, I, I lost count of channels and stuff. Um, but there was a contact on everything. Anything that, anything that made a slight noise made an amplified noise and was processed in some way in real time. Uh, it was a, an installation in which the performance happened duration of about, ooh, I think it lasts about an hour and a half with an interval. Um, and it was spontaneous. Everybody designed their own instrument or there was two or three people. The person on the left top, that's a sculpture, person in the middle, you can't see, but all those little things under, under which the woman is lying were little pigs with, and little hammers hit the pig's tail and every time a hammer hit the pig's tail, the pig went Wah! and um, up here was a bunch of strings with beads. May Day was um, another large installation piece, similar, similar groupings of students, um, but much more kind of performance oriented. Um, at one end you see there and at the other end was was a kind of mashup of people taking images and performing the cut up of different faces and re retransposing people's faces and projecting them and um, uh, that was student this is stuff that I've uh, been involved in myself this was a refurbishment of the Salisbury Cathedral um, this was called eight centuries of music um, and there were all manner of types of uh, chanters, folk, coronets and uh, sack butts, um, fife and field drum, brass band, um, madrigal group, recorder group. Um, there was, that was a kind of pageant in the afternoon. Um, and then in the evening there was a concert with the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra and fireworks and projections on the, on the face of the cathedral. That was a live BBC broadcast. 2000 and something to Queen's Jubilee Parade. That was another. This picture here is the history of the articulated vehicle, starting with the pram going right through, <clears throat> but involving motorbikes and three wheel cars. And that was quite, this, this in fact was quite a huge gig that, um, believe it or not, there was a million people on the mall. And um, I worked with the uh, director called Hilary Westlake, who I've worked with lots and lots and lots. And uh, it, was, it was for the Queen, and I did see the Queen. Um, I didn't wave, though. Um, there were lots of designs of the social, design was of the social history of the UK since 1952. Um, and so, um, in true English fashion, they had to celebrate the change in eating, eating habits. And so there were actually six or five different um, floats that had different kinds of food on them, starting with kind of um, fish and chips and going through much more exotic cuisines. So basically these ideas are about sight and about, um, I guess, large scale vision, large scale vision to, in fact, sell ideas to a number of crucial components that could form collaborative partnerships. Um, I think that this, this space here has always offered such opportunities because there's ready-made performance areas apart from which there's, there's kind of ready-made site-specific beaches and a variety of different cultural contexts and precincts. Um, so I guess that in terms of mm, digital arts media, the way in which that can be realised is... Um, is really 
um, a matter of producing innovative teaching and learning experiences, offering students the opportunity to actually have a good time when they're learning something. It seems to me that more and more what happens is that there is an expectation that students are entertained rather than students kind of work out how to entertain themselves. Now, if we can crack that, and that is always a, a, a central issue with, with my teaching, is how to actually empower students to have a good time for themselves as opposed to relying on um, what I call the dog and pony show to roll its kind of little cart in and wave things at them and wake them up. Um, one of the ways that I find that this works is to actually document work produced by research. Well, docu I said document work by, produced by researchers, student and staff. Um, if you start with students, students love documenting work, putting it on YouTube, taking it, remashing it, reordering it, and making different kinds of art with it. So, so the idea about the fact that um, people are now as young people engaging in this way with art that sometimes they had nothing to do with creating is something that, that we as, as, as educators can know, well, we can't turn our back on that. We can no longer turn our back and say, oh, this is kids having fun, or this is young people dealing with technology in a particular kind of way. This is, in fact, a, um, a, a major movement that is going to roll into what we now call digital arts. So in a way, I think that this, the, these fundamental ideas about pedagogy or about teaching are assisted in digital media practice, are assisted. And I think that quite often what happens is that the, the media or the medium gets used or abused or misused and the notion that it is actually reflective um, is not uh, is not emphasised enough with students. Um, just a few few ideas: digital media asset creation mechanisms, um, databases, um, <coughs> free sound. Free sounds are um, things set up by a university now. It's like everybody goes to get free. Sounds off free sound, fantastic asset that it is, and it really is just a site that was set up by a university that said, okay, well, we're going to give sound away, people download your sound, upload something, et cetera, et cetera. The number, the, 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 the kind of, um, the kind of uh, flow through that happens as a result of those kind of online mechanisms and the development of that kind of um, IT infrastructure is very important. Uh, strategic interdisciplinary research groupings, profiling work, um, the idea that uh, there are a number of different people, for example, before we were just talking about a lot of people doing flash, oh, we do flash, oh, we do flash, oh, yes, we do flash as well, and somebody else does flash, animation does flash, um, you know, architects do flash, and the idea of, of actually having a kind of digital media um, layer is that the best things that happen can actually be highlighted and um, be made as templates or exemplars for excellence uh, is something that uh, not necessarily always happens. And that this is one of the things that we're looking at in the Institute uh, at Kingston. Um, publish and license in-house digital media assets. Um, that's part of the course now. Everybody. Everybody, I think in the future there will be, there will be notions about, who, about ownership and about the, the providing of educational opportunities to people in particular places where, for example, we sign um, learning contracts with students and learning contracts with students about their work and about who owns their work and about what happens to their work and how their work might be used or the images of their work might be used. Um, I think that that's going to actually get ranked up and students will be involved from the moment they come into a tertiary institution, those kind of um, business negotiations. Um, this is a, this is a um, Thelonious Monk piece. <laughs>
attempts to explain it. Not much has changed. The music is the same whether you play a harmonica or a big orchestra. The difference is the pain that lives between one note and the next. Black or white country, jazz and the electric chair. Yeah. Questions. Works in progress. Practicalities of film and music working together. I wonder if you had any comments. We're a uh, film school that makes documentary film, narrative film, and animation film. I just wondered if you had some comments on that. One of the things that I found um, in fine art kind of ties in with what you're alluding to, is that uh, in 90s terms, remember the IT revolution was so long ago, artists get it. In other words, they just see sound as another kind of substance, and they stick it there, and that looks good, and that goes with that. Or oh, turn it down a bit, or oh, squish it up a bit, or oh, stretch it, or oh. they're not obsessed with the notion that, oh, what, what, should I put a G chord there or G minor? Or, you know, they're not obsession with, obsessed with the particular. Music has, a, has sometimes, when it interfaces with, with visual culture, has an obsession with the particular. What goes with what, you know, does this go with that? So people with a different kind of um, visual sensibility usually find it quite easy to put found sound with images that work. Um, in terms of collaborative effort, I always find it's better to put filmmakers with fine artists. Now, that's not such an unusual thing if you look at the way in which film and fine art have been, and certainly in art films, uh, have been kind of married from the beginning. And the notion that you know, a film is a piece of art um, as opposed to um, a film is a a, a visual, piece of visual um, text that is then in some way emotionally supported with a soundtrack um, is a model that is continually being challenged right from the start when the you know, piano player was reading the, the context or the emotional subtext of whatever the images were that were going by and making it happy when it was happy and sad when it was sad. Um, I think the way in which that whole area interfaces has to do with a sensibility about sound and not necessarily a sensibility about music. And one of the things about music for film and television and the training of people for being involved in that is almost a detraining of them being involved in being attached to text, writing the music out, and about listening and looking and understanding what happens when you see something with something that has an authentic um, marriage going with whatever it is that it sounds like. And um, I, I teach two, two subjects um, to groups of 70 each about 70. Um, one was just called uh, audio art, the other one's called sound design and the moving image. Sound design and the moving image is all about designing sound with image, as opposed to underscoring. The notion of underscoring, again, I think these things are economic, much more pragmatic about why stuff happens um, in relation to that. For example, the computer comes along, it's cheap to go, blog, blomp, 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 sample, sample, process, process, um, get somebody in to do digga, digga, digga here, um, get somebody in to play a violin there, a guitar here, sample, sample, move the ball around, make a, make a, a library, 
give them to the give it to the film editor. The film editor has usually got an artistic sensibility that comes from a, not, although lots of musicians, but comes from a different kind of um, music sound sensibility. And so all the all the approaches to teaching that I think go back through Cage, go back through Irumoreists, the Futurists, and have a notion about. Um, what it is that something sounds like when you see it. In fact, it's the, it's the focus of my research, which is about making um, three-dimensional images of vocal utterances. So my research is about what does a sad sigh look like? So if you go, oh, um, or oh. So if, is it plosive or is it sequential? Uh, and I've used various programs like Max and MSP and Jitter. Um, and then what I've been doing is I've been playing the sound and asking people what they think it is. And then I've been showing the image and asking people what they think it is. And it's very interesting, it's very interesting that the interpretation of abstract images is very difficult for people to is very difficult for people to ascertain unless it's colour coded in some way. If it's ah and it's red and it's aggressive and explosive, they'll go oh angry or so. There are you know there are boundaries within which um, these things are kind of explainable in traditional terms. Um, but the way in which uh, film and television and I'm really uh, Howard, my friend that I was talking about, uh, he teaches uh, screen composition at the Royal College. And we talk about this continually about, and I've taught on the MA at, at Kingston as well, um, music for film and television. We talk, continually talk about um, deprogramming musicians for the writing of music with film. We're not talking about music. No, it's not music. No. You sound like Andrew Lloyd Webber trying to write a score to a film. It's wrong, you know. You, the whole thing about the, the, the nature of the relationship is not necessarily that music or sound is subservient, and it is not necessarily that the image is subservient. It's a symbiotic, it's a marriage. And that's very, very um, interesting area of teaching, particularly in art school, and in music school. I would do that as a matter of course in the program. I'm sure you That's do. always part of the program. Yeah. Um, second year kind of level. Yeah. Particularly then we did. Film school, you know, yeah. We work with these guys and all these guys. <laughs> and, and as you say before, I'm mean, really thing, the only way you're going to be able to get this kind of thing happening is based on sort of a probably personal relationship among um, faculty in terms of um, in terms of encouraging some kind of, you know, collaboration, but look, it's, it's, it's obvious to me in terms of, I mean, it's certainly much more in animation because of the visual medium and, and, and even what you were just talking about now about visuals for sound and, and you know, what does the sound look like and how does it feel and all those sorts of things, that's, uh, that's just part of the program. Yeah. But what I'm kind of... Um, looking for is, is, is really it's just the next step from here. Like so much of something of what we're talking about, even in terms of collaborative kind of arrangements, it, uh, probably because of the film media, it's, it's interdisciplinary by nature. And, and, and so it's really, I mean, certainly in terms of the next levels of research, and, and and even practical kind of ways of of how we can go further in in what we're doing in terms of teaching in terms of research and uh, even in in terms of external activities also in practical practical ways of being able to, to, to get this happening because I, I think it's a given that we we want to and we need to but Mm. But, um, but I suppose it's just how do we, how do we go about it and, and from experience, from bigger experience. Designing a database is quite a um, demanding and complex thing to do. It, at the next stage of what I would describe that you've just described as undergraduate engagement with sound is 
engagement with a lot of things that musicians actually understand a lot about. Forms, forms that come from traditions of um, and musical context, whether those forms be from world musics, Western art music, jazz, um, sonic art, audio art, and the way in which form and structure is mirrored and plays um, in film. Now, there are lots of traditional models from Hollywood to Goddard. And, you know, there's uh, Nino Rotter to, you know, um, Williams. Um, and there's a whole lot of other things in between that basically amount to different schools of understanding about periods of history of music or histories of sound and the way in which those things are translated visually. Sometimes um, I've worked with um, directors who are obsessive about the, the formalistic structure or non-formalistic structure or the structure of what it is that's happening in this time-based work. And there is a, you know, there is a, a a, a, a cathartic point to which we're going, and then then we're tailing off. Classic, um, sort of uh, cliche, yeah, Hollywood thing. Um, but there are many, 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 as you probably well know, other kinds of forms. Now, the way in which those forms interact with music is a very interesting and important issue to understand. When you talk to a director, and you're a musician. You have to, and this is, the, this is the kind of key about interdisciplinary practice. When you talk to a director and you're a musician, you have to know how to talk the director's language, or the director has to know how to talk your language. Now, sometimes to all directors want to talk about is particular images from art, from the art world. So you've got to go and find out what it is that they're talking about, or otherwise you know. You know uh, Namajira's work, and you know that this particular kind of um, coloration um, has to be expressed sonically in some kind of in some kind of believable way, or you know that you know um, you, you, we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci and we're talking about technical drawings about various things that have to be expressed in particular kind of ways. So periodic understandings of the histories sometimes is very important. Sometimes it's not. If you look at Elizabeth or Shakespeare in Love, you know, there's a kind of complete bastardization or um, postmodern kind of working over of what is seen as being um, Baroque music or classical music, um, you know, bought neoed, neofied, um, just using the same instruments and, you know, similar kind of stylistic traits, but definitely 20th century music, definitely film music. It's really a, a way of teaching that um, that in a sense is being um, renegotiated because of this art science thing that I put up before. And the scientists have been pounding away at SSR, student staff ratios, and saying, look, we're scientists, we teach, um, I te one person teaches 100 people in a lecture the theatre for two hours. You're a piano player, you get a, a lesson, one person teaches um, somebody in a piano studio for two hours. They get paid the same. You, you've got in your studio 20 students and I've got 100 students. So, you know, the ratio is 1 to 100 or 1 to 20, you know. And the pressure that organisations have had to um, kind of negotiate is that kind of debate where the pragmatists are saying, well, we make all the money, so, um, you know, we should have more say about what happens and why is it that one person is teaching. So that's, that's, about, that's about a culture that has kind of um, trickled on and trickled on um, with a model that is actually um, kind of, in a sense, um, um, an apprenticeship model that still exists. My son's just finished being a mechanic. And he he um, doesn't want to be a mechanic um, after being an apprentice to somebody. Um, not because of the relationship, but because of a whole lot of other things. But that one-to-one -one relationship 
even as a mechanic these days, he was in a garage with seven other mechanics. And the relationship that he had with the person who was his mentor was shared by the other seven mechanics. So it wasn't as though he was learning off one person. He was learning off all the other people who were fixing cars in the same, in the same place. Now, if they've got it in industry, you, know, you can bet that the reason why that has happened is because somebody in Ford who he works for has argued that, oh, we can't have one apprentice with one person. We've got to... That's happened in academia. And that, that argument will continue to go on. Same thing happens with art, with fine art. Um, people have have one to one relationships, um, and what you're what you're also talking about is um, practitioners. You're talking about practitioners. You're talking about piano players who go out and do gigs and play piano somewhere and concerts and whatever. So, if they're practitioners and they're teaching, and part of their practice is teaching, then they don't necessarily engage with the same kinds of things that um, a, an academic who's interested in a variety of things across music is interested in context, theory, history, composition, musicology, blah, 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 etc., etc. So, um, I mean, you know, that's a raging debate. I mean, it, for example, in Kingston, Kingston University, where I teach, in music, <clears throat> what happened was, in the last three years, they had 150 people and learning music in three years, 50-50-50. This year, for the first year, they've, well, last year, they changed the relationship of one-to-one -one teaching and they cut the one-to-one -one teaching in half. Instead of 24 hours a year, you were getting a le less than half. You were getting 11 hours a year. And there were lots of other augmenting group seminar presentation master classes that went into fill in the gap group teaching they then this year have taken on 90 new students 90 students alone in music technology not counting the 60 that they take on in ordinary other kind of music studies so their first year next year this coming year in September when I go back will be 150 which is the same as what the school used to be before as a whole school. Now there's 150 in first year, and that will go on. So the growth will be from 150 to 450 after three years. Now think about it. That's what's happening to music education in universities that are not conservatoires. It's not happening in the conservatoires. They're, but they're those kind of negotiations. And that is because of a whole range of issues that has to do with the influence of institutions such as universities, the, ins the, the influence of scientists and the, the pragmatic no, uh, nature of the scientific argument that's been brought to bear, um, and just sort of pragmatic issues about money, budget, how much things cost. So, um, and if you think about the world, you know, that. So you might lose one-to-one -one teaching. It'll become a really expensive thing to do and people will go and have lessons and become really good and then people who are really good at something will get much more money for doing it and then the market will change and if capitalism is supposed to work as it's supposed to work, he said cynically, um, it'll come back around the other way, maybe, perhaps. Frank, I don't know that what you're presenting there is, is completely factual. I, 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 I don't think that people are necessarily, um, you know, abandoning one-to-one -one on economic grounds. And, and I think there are very few people who are willingly abandoning one-to-one -one anyway, because I think it's got a role. But I think what, what, what else is happening is people are sort of going, well, maybe this shouldn't be the exclusive model. Maybe it shouldn't just be... Um, you know, Broads and, and the mechanic no, in a one-to-one -one relationship. Maybe there should be... It's some, economic. It's got to be economic. Uh, no, so I don't believe yeah, it is. I, I believe there's another whole layer of, of, of uh, argument going on. Certainly in the AEC, for example, the Association of European Conservatoires, people are looking at the, 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 the specific kinds of fabulous learning that can occur in one-to-one, -one, uh, the specific kinds of fabulous learning that can, can occur uh, in a masterclass situation the specific kinds of fabulous learning that can occur in a peer-to-peer in -peer right. environment. Okay. And the, 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 the imperative, certainly in the AEC, and amongst most of the people that I talk to, 
um, is actually to sort of go, well, you know, this is what we do now. What can we add to what we do now to make the learning experience for students um, a more satisfactory and more complete thing whilst they're under our, under our influence? I, I mean, you know, it's, I think that's what's actually happening. People are looking at it pedagogically with a broader palette than they were previously. And they're trying to say, well, what is it that's great about this mode compared to this mode compared to this mode? And what kinds of blends of these modes mm. should, should we actually be offering our students yeah. for their benefit? Not for our benefit, but for their benefit. I think, that, I think that's a very uh, conservatoire-centric view. I think that what's happening in... <laughs> What's happening, in, what's happening in the rest of the institutions that teach music is different. I think what's happened in the UK is that the Royal Academy, the Royal College, Guildhall, maybe the Royal Northern, and really kind of skating in on their skirt tails, Trinity, maybe Trinity. They have, in fact, established themselves with a different kinds of um, funding and or support for mentorial learning. Not to disagree with what you're saying in relation to the suite of things that is presented to a student to enhance the student experience. Absolutely. That is, and those institutions too have um, gone down the track of um, putting in place research um, nodes and little uh, centres and are investigating various kind of aspects to do with performance or to do with, um, you know, ensemble playing or all manner of specialism around notions of performance and or composition and or musicology. Um, and that has meant that the conservatoires have become the place to go if you're going to learn to be a practitioner of that kind. You're not going to go to a conservatoire necessarily to do music technology. This place here is quite unusual very unusual because it's actually got music technology and popular music in a conservatoire. Where does that happen in does the Royal College? No. Guildhall? Eh? Well, oh, I see. Oh, I see. Well, okay. Exactly. Well, I, no, small marketplace, I think. Smaller marketplace. But no, the, you see what I'm saying? So institutions are becoming specialised. And that's the push. That's the real push. I mean, I'm, I agree with you about the whole issue about um, student experience. Everybody's kind of paranoid about student experience and making student experience a wonderful and beautiful thing because they're spending money now and, you know, we're calling them clients and, you know, blah, 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 and we're trying to get them from every part of the world to come to wherever we are to spend their £10,000 a year in our institution. And why wouldn't we want to make it a, a great experience for them? Like, it should be a great experience, but no. There's been, you know, an industry model applied to this. In other words, certain people produce really good things in that area and they become known for that. Other people produce really good things in that area and they become known as that. The big thing that's happened in the UK that's very interesting is the rise of the independent provider. And the independent provider has actually stolen, you know, the whole field of popular music off all those people. There's no popular music anywhere except, you know, there's rock school, there's ACM, Academy of Contemporary Music, um, Brighton Institute of Modern Music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. BAQC, I went to the con, I graduated in the first BA that was at the con here in 1970. Um, MA CUNY, City or University of New York, I did uh, computer music with a guy called Charles Dodge. Um, that's a name drop not impresses any of you, obviously, because um, <coughs> no one really does computer. Is there any computer music? No? Yeah, it does, actually, completely. <laughs> um, he now grows fruit, makes wine. Um, PhD at UQ, APAI, as Paul just mentioned, principal lecturer, uh, art, performance, and digital media. I'm a course director of the, that course, Art, Performance, and Digital Media, and uh, which was called, and sometimes called, Live Art. And I'm also on the development team for um, the establishment of a institute in digital media. School of Fine Art, um, Kingston University, which is on the Thames. I spent some time in uh, music, 99 to 04, 
and then I transferred to fine art uh, because of this course that I wrote. Um, one, of the thing, one of the reasons that motivated that was that I was all, always been interested in popular music and jazz and that I found it quite extraordinary being in the UK that all the great pop musicians came out of art schools and I thought to myself, well, I really want to find out what happens in art schools uh, as to why uh, this happens and why no uh, musicians of that kind of calibre come out of music schools. And that led me on a kind of really interesting journey that um, <clears throat> brings me to uh, here. Number of courses that I've written, BA ONS in live arts, BA ONS in popular music, ONS in jazz, MA in popular music, performance composition musicology, uh, one that I'm working on now is uh, digital performance. Um, and there's been a few that I've started and not gone on with. One in particular that keeps on raising its head is an MA in music theatre. Uh, I've designed courses for and consulted with other people. There's a place in the UK in Guildford called ACM, which is uh, validated by Middlesex University. Uh, I've written a lot of material for their course, and th that course is also validated in Bologna in Italy, uh, Brighton Institute and the Bristol Institute of Modern Music. Um, and every year for four years I taught in Hong Kong um, a combination of jazz popular music and traditional Western art music. And I've taught in a variety of... Um, I mean, that's more an indication of survival than, than expertise, the number of courses that I've taught. Um, film and television. Um, I've done a sprinkling of lots of different kinds of things, mainly in the area of documentary. Uh, the, one of the reasons for going to the UK was to work with a guy who actually started electronic music here at the Con in 1972 when it was at Gardens Point. His name is uh, Howard Davison, who is a teacher of mine, and I've continued to work with him over the years. With him, I've <coughs> worked on Conquistadors, Michael Wood, uh, Story of India, Michael Wood, both six-part, four-part in a six-part series, BBC, uh, Station X, um, the Enigma Code, Tuning, The Beginning of Computing. Well, that was actually a six-part series for Channel 4. Um, things I've done with Pat and uh, also with Paul, A Fair Go, 1966 Referendum about Aboriginals, Red Ted and the Great Depression, Theodore, first uh, the uh, Labour Party uh, treasurer who advocated uh, Keynesian economics during the Depression. Um, Flame of Freedom was a large-scale event at, um, that celebrated 100 years or 50 years of the end of the war in the Pacific. Um, that was a, a very um, collaborative, multidisciplinary, multi and interdisciplinary project that used people here from the con. A uh, number of recordings, uh, noise works, Max Q with Michael Hutchins. I played in Grace Knight's band for a long time. Worked with the Cleopatra Wong out of uh, the Go-Betweens. Made a few of my own albums. Um, jazz things with uh, people like Ray Aldridge, Euro Gliders, um, music theatre and site-specific work. Um, more notably, Mysterioso, um, which is actually touring Italy now. It's about... Um, a jazz piece, uh, Thelonious Monk, um, Circus Lumiere, um, back to Expo actually, and my relationship with this particular site is that um, I wrote a lot of music for Expo, including Music 4, and uh, co-designing the Queensland Pavilion ride, um, which used to be called Multimedia, and those with kind of Multimedia ride. Uh, three shows at what was the plaza, shows on the it was, in fact, um, <clears throat> my first kind of major gig, Dining with Alice, site-specific work, um, Brightside, Edinburgh Festival uh, Fringe, Pick of the Fringe Award, what do they call it, Perrier Award in 1980-something, um, Margate Beach a couple of years ago, um, site-specific work on the beach. Whew. Okay, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> 